Right. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Colin. Um, I always find it interesting that I think from my um, graduate um, committee and groups of folks, um, Colin is the one that I keep in touch with, I think, the most, <laughs> which is really fun. Um, so thank you for having me here. Um, this is sort of a different type of talk um, for me. I'm used to giving um, research talks, um, and if anyone has any interest on sort of some of the, the work that I do on um, field ecology stuff with the Boston area climate experiments and other things, I'm more than happy to talk um, with folks about that later. But, um, but I wanted to talk with you about some of the, the work that I'm doing at Babson. I'm a field ecologist teaching at a business school. Right? And so most people um, would sort of question why on earth I would make that decision and why on earth Babson would make that decision to hire um, an ecologist. And actually, we have a couple of us there now, um, so we're, we're growing. Uh, so um, I wanted to give you a little bit of um, sort of background on that um, and, uh, and tell you sort of what we've been doing. So this is the outline that I thought um, I would have for this talk. I'd start off a little bit talking about sort of why business needs ecology. And this is something uh, that I start off every one of my courses, no matter what they are, um, sort of impressing upon students why it is uh, that as future business leaders, they need to understand ecology in particular, environmental science, and, but in particular ecology. Um, and then since I'm at Babson in kind of a, a unique position, um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about Babson and some of our approaches to sustainability. Um, we call it um, Sears, like many colleges, we are sort of a, a world of acronyms, right? So we've got Sears, um, which I'll talk about, and ETNA. Um, and then I'd, I thought I'd mention a bit about our science curriculum, um, because I think it's kind of unique. Um, and for any folks who are graduate students or even undergraduates, um, thinking about sort of different careers and where they may want to end up, um, I'll sort of give a, a little plug for thinking um, sort of outside the box um, and kind of differently for where you might want to be. Um, and then I wanted to focus in on some of the case studies that I thought would be particularly interesting, um, maybe to you, um, and particularly to my students, for how to join ecology and business. Um, and so I'll mention um, a course uh, that I taught in ecotourism, and a little bit about sort of why that makes sense um, to teach for business students. Um, I'll talk about life cycle assessments, LCAs. Um, as something I now have as a core component um, of one of my main courses um, and sort of as a, a group project, how that works. Um, then biomimicry, which is something I have a, a growing fascination with. I think it's the perfect joining of ecology and business together um, and then sort of leading to closing the loop and kind of industrial symbiosis. Um, so that's the plan. Um, I'll sort of try to tie it together with some conclusions at the end. If you have any questions as I'm going on, please feel free um, to raise your hand. I'm more than happy to sort of stop um, and answer questions. Um, can everyone can hear me okay? I'm good? Okay. All right. So um, this is what I present um, to my business students on the first day of class um, to sort of make them realize why it is that they need to be sitting as a business student taking at least two science courses, right? Um, why do you need to know this stuff? Why is this of concern? Um, and it is really this resource crunch right here. So, you know, predictions for the future. Um, with our natural resources, I explained this um, resource funnel, which I think is a handy way of um, sort of maybe scaring <laughs> folks a little bit, right? Thinking about natural resources, you know, including those that are really vital for survival, as well as things that businesses need to keep functioning, um, and the decline. Right, so we've got decline of amount and availability as well as quality. Um, so ecosystem services declining. And then increasing demand, right? So through um, increasing human population, increasing affluence, we have a growing demand. So if you're a business student and you look at this, you say we have a supply and demand problem, right? Um, we're stuck here sort of somewhere in the, in the funnel that's closing in. And this is particularly important because like I mentioned, a lot of these are, are vital resources that people need to survive. So we're talking about fresh water availability, um, food and arable land availability, and of course, within that mix, um, the whole sort of complication with energy um, and energy resources. Piled on top, we can look at some of the changes that businesses are now trying to figure out when it comes to climate change. Right? So what are the costs of climate change? I mean, some of them are, are incredibly severe. We start looking at sort of life costs. Um, right, how many people are going to lose their lives. Um, and businesses are also trying to calculate sort of 
What's the dollar sign cost? How much as we increase in, this is 1.5 degrees C, 2.5 and 4.5, um, looking at change in global GDP. Um, so how much are we talking about here? Um, and who's gonna pay these? How, how is this gonna work? So environmental issues um, are a huge risk for business. Um, and this is something I think um, you know, businesses that are, um, as I encourage our students always to be sort of ahead of the game, right, are well aware of um, and trying to figure out. You don't want to be the last company um, to try to figure out how you're going to budget carbon um, because you're going to be trapped behind and you're going to be stuck with no options. Um, so you can see um, just a couple of um, reports looking at um, some of the profit at risk, some, some of the dollar signs this is from the state of green business that came out recently, looking at um, sort of the... Um, the potential costs, right, the profit that is at risk from the impacts that are going to happen to natural capital, and natural capital being natural resources and ecosystem services. Um, so huge percentages um, of our natural capital at risk um, from loss uh, for profit. Um, and you can also look here, this is from TEEB, which is another interesting resource um, if anyone's um, interested, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, um, that took an analysis of the top 100 externalities of business. Um, and they actually ranked them here and looked through different sectors in different regions for the cost. Right? So this is natural capital cost in billions um, of dollars here. And you can see number one, coal power in Eastern Asia, probably not surprising to most folks. Um, number two, cattle ranching and farming in South America. Um, then three, coal power generation here in North America and wheat farming and rice farming um, in southern Asia. So um, there's a lot at stake um, when it comes to understanding sort of the ecology for what's going on for business. And these risks, um, which um, you can see here, kind of taking a, a more holistic approach, you can see climate change policy risk, market risk, climate change impact risks, which I've already mentioned. Um, along with these, there's also reputational risk. Right? You want to be the company um, that's getting slammed um, for being the one or the few that are not um, up to date um, with sustainability initiatives, or do you want to be ahead of the curve pushing the trends? Um, along with those go credit risks and financial risks, and there's all these sort of drivers and pushes for, um, for business. Some of those can come like a slap on the wrist from government, right? So you can have regulations set in place, things like carbon cap and trade, which Unfortunately, I've been saying for too long, but is coming at some point, right, to the United States. Um, and if you're a company that's doing work in the European Union, you need to be on top of this. Um, there's also lots more consumer demand, so rising up um, sort of from consumers demanding more sustainable products, more organic products, um, and more information about sort of what's in our products and where it's coming from, um, so more transparency. And so businesses really have, you know, a couple different um, options here. They can sort of adapt and comply with these. Um, or they can really take what I encourage my students to do is the opportunistic approach, right? There's huge amounts of opportunities here um, to be able to invest, um, you know, kind of understand where the situation is, invest properly, um, and um, potentially create new revenue streams, new technologies, um, right, that you can get involved in. So that's sort of usually my opening um, to my students um, for whatever course it is that I'm teaching. Um, and um, for those that may not be familiar with Babson College, I felt like I'd give just a little rundown. Um, it's a private four-year college in Wellesley, Massachusetts, um, so relatively nearby. Um, we've got a little over 2,000 undergraduate students. Um, we have about the same in graduate students, um, but those are MBA students. Um, we actually just crossed over um, a couple years ago now where we have more female students than male, um, which I find very exciting as someone who is um, encouraging um, women in science and technology and business. Um, we have 30% um, of our domestic students identify as multicultural. We have got about 25% international students with a large diversity um, of different countries, which is really interesting in the classroom uh, because when we start talking about different environmental problems around the world. You know, I have students from um, Dubai and from um, India who can talk about some of the um, firsthand experiences that they've had. Our classroom sizes is roughly 20 to 42. Um, in science, for what I teach, we max out at 36. 
Um, so all of our classrooms um, are, are less than 36. Um, and they're all business students, right? So everyone who goes to Babson gets a BS in business management. Um, during their course load, half of their work needs to be uh, business courses, but then the other half have to be liberal arts. So they get, I think, a fairly good uh, mix in science in this world counts as a liberal arts, um, which is always hilarious to me because as an undergraduate student, I had good friends that were in sort of liberal arts field, humanities and things, and I was on science on the other end, right? Um, but here we're all in it together, um, which is interesting and actually allows um, for some opportunities for me. Um, so you can see we have a very strong entrepreneurial focus. That's probably um, maybe what you've heard of Babson, and if you listen to NPR, they're constantly sort of pushing that as they're advertising there. Um, so our mission statement um, is that we educate entrepreneurial leaders who create great economic and social value everywhere. And so some of what that means is that we have this strong commitment uh, to what we call SEERS. Um, so SEERS for us is social, economic, and environmentally responsible sustainability. Sort of a mouthful. Um, but um, it is a core component of our strategy for teaching. So Babson takes this approach um, that uh, we've written about in a couple of books, and I've been lucky enough um, to, um, to write a couple chapters in each of these, um, talking about sort of the different components that identify entrepreneurial thought and action. Um, and Sears is one large component. The other, and I realize this is a little hard to see, I apologize, um, is um, self and context. So being sort of certainly self-aware and culturally aware um, of sort of um, what's going on around you. And then what we call cognitive ambidexterity. Um, so being creative, um, but also um, uh, you know, able to do um, some tough skills in analytics and prediction logic um, and things like that. So Sears is one of our main core learning goals. Um, we have six or seven now, I think, um, core learning goals, um, things like rhetoric and quantitative skills, and Sears is, is one of the, the other major ones where um, we want to educate business leaders to make ethical decisions based upon an awareness of all the relevant stakeholders and simultaneously create social, environmental, and economic value. So although all of our students are, are business um, uh, majors, we also have various different concentrations. Um, so, you know, entrepreneurship is one, one of the, the really popular ones. Um, we have um, gender studies. We have, um, you know, a whole variety of different types of things that students can concentrate in. It's sort of like a minor. Basically, you take sort of four courses um, to fulfill this. And um, a couple of years ago, I started a new concentration in environmental sustainability. Um, and it's been growing, which I'm really, really excited about. We started off with just a couple of students um, a few years ago, and now, last I checked a couple of days ago, I think we're up to about 26 um, students, which I know doesn't sound huge, but for us, that's, that's growing, that's pretty good, um, where we have students that take four, record, four courses. Um, one is required to be within intermediate science, Right, which is where I'm getting to, what I'm going to focus on, um, an ecology-based um, course. And then the other three can be um, from a whole suite of different courses that we offer. Um, um, anything from sort of a philosophy course in nature, technology, and values, um, entrepreneurship courses, um, uh, global climate change courses within science, humanities courses, um, and a, a fairly popular environmental economics course. Mm -hmm. So science at Babson, um, I think, uh, is a really interesting opportunity. We do not teach any um, sort of basic um, biology, chemistry, physics, or earth science. So there's no bio 101 um, that students take. Um, I think uh, way back prior to when I came in Babson in 2007, maybe 10, 20 years before that, they used to do um, something like that where they had kind of structure for that. Um, and students didn't find any sort of relevance to it. Um, they weren't so interested in it. And so what we've done is we've created courses that touch on each of those disciplines and sort of in an interdisciplinary way um, around a kind of cool theme, um, teach those different things together um, under one. So we really focus um, instead of the content for, um, you know, a, a, what would be needed to be learned for a Bio 101, we focus on 
scientific methodology and complex problem solving. Um, and we really talk about um, science as being, a, the scientific method as being a really important tool for entrepreneurs, right? For entrepreneurs that are going to go out there and start our, their own business and huge numbers of our students plan on doing that. Some of them do, um, but a lot are gung-ho and they are ready. Um, and some of them are, are, are trying it already, right, while they're in, in college um, to start their own business. You know, science is a fantastic tool um, to be able to learn how to set something up appropriately, fail at it, right? Figure out what went wrong, draw conclusions, and try again. Um, so um, we try to really hit that home. Um, and with all of our courses, we have a strong application to business um, and everyday life. Part of the challenge here is to have students, many of whom didn't really like science, maybe part of the reason why they're a business student, um, and so have them really see that science is all around them and that it matters, right? Um, and so we actually have as one of our goals for our science group um, to excite students about science um, and to get them so that they could pick up the New York Times science section and read it voluntarily, right? Um, that, that would be a huge goal. Um, so uh, these courses emphasize environmental and um, technological awareness. Um, I'll run down just sort of our, our curriculum here just so that you can get an idea, and then I'm going to focus in on, on some of them. Um, so our foundation courses, we have two required science courses for all of our students. The foundation courses um, have sort of a, a broad background. They really focus on inductive and deductive um, reasoning, um, introducing critical and scientific thinking. We have, um, you know, an emphasis on our, our labs. We do sort of really out-of-the-box um, labs, like in some of my labs, I had students kind of create bioplastic um, and, um, you know, build little ecosystems that they then go and cause climate change to. Um, so not typical lab manual um, labs. Um, and uh, we try to introduce some Sears concepts, so that idea of sort of um, simultaneous economic, environmental, and social um, responsibility. These are our, our current um, courses um, for offerings, so students can choose to, to, to take any of these. Um, and whichever one they choose, they can then take any of the intermediate courses. So there's no sort of um, lock and step, um, you know, sequence of courses. Um, so we've got energy and the environment, and these are, this is a picture here of some of my students um, that I challenge them, give them um, some pools of carbon, and they've got to be able to figure out um, how they connect and how they move together, um, which is something um, that they find initially quite challenging, um, and then um, can start, you know, hearing business students talking about, no, 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 I think the carbon moves from here to there um, is incredibly uh, uplifting and, and exciting, I think. Uh, we've got electronics, biotechnology, astronomy, and oceanography. Our intermediate courses um, use a case studies approach. And in that approach, I take that term um, very liberally. Um, I know some of my friends in, in business, um, you know, use uh, business case studies. Um, I've used one or two, but I tend to use them as examples, right? So this is really trying to hone in and talk about specific examples um, uh, of issues um, that you can bring into class. Um, and we really stress systems level thinking in these classes. Um, so um, really getting students to move beyond the expectation that things sort of linearly move in one direction is kind of a, an easy flow to understand sort of very complex systems. Um, and ecology is perfect for that, right? It is itself um, the system um, that you can study, very complex feedback loops. You pull one thing and you see lots and lots of changes. Um, and getting them to think about that, whether it's for ecology or for political systems or education systems, right, is really valuable. So our current three um, intermediate courses are case studies in sustainable um, food systems, which actually will be taught for the first time in the fall, um, uh, case studies in biomedical systems, and then case studies in ecological systems management, um, which is sort of my um, e applied ecology course. We also have advanced electives, so students can choose if they love science to take some more science, um, which is fantastic. Um, and these are sort of, you know, deeper dives um, into kind of some specific um, areas. We've got a climate change course, a scientific innovation and business course, nutrition and disease, natural disasters, economic botany, which again is my um, course, and I, I threw in my picture here 
um, of uh, students. We went out yesterday to tap all the um, maples on campus, not all of them, but um, a good number of maples on campus um, to start collecting maple um, sap and, and create maple syrup, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then um, ecotourism, um, the biodiversity conservation and policy in Costa Rica, of course. So I wanted to focus in on that one. I think ecotourism is a really great way to sort of blend ecology and practical business, right? Um, and so we taught this, it was a few years ago now, and um, we're looking to teach it again, sort of trying to work out some of the logistics um, to be able to do it again. Um, but it was really an amazing experience. It was actually my first time um, ever in the tropics, so I was there teaching tropical ecology, having never been there uh, myself, which is always interesting. Um, so this is a co-taught course. I co-taught this with a law professor, um, which also was a really interesting experience. We were just, Ben and I were talking about the advantages for um, co-teaching. It's about three times more work to actually co-teach something, um, which can be daunting. Um, but it's an amazingly rewarding experience um, for, as a, from a teacher's side. Um, you learn so much, and the students see you learn so much, um, which is really, um, I think, sort of transformative for them. So um, this course we taught, we had some fall sort of prep sessions before, and then it was two weeks um, in January, which I think is sort of a similar setup as you have, right, for, um, for your course. So these are, are some of my business students out here appreciating the value of ants, right, out there in the... Um, in the tropics, um, we went to some coffee farms and um, made some um, sugar from sugar cane. Um, and this is sort of our, our general um, topics that were in the course um, that we taught, and they were sort of all, all integrated together so that we had um, sort of discussions about ecology and law um, sort of at, at the same time. One of the things that was really, um, I think, eye-opening for the students and the great part of this being kind of a hands-on course uh, was that we required students to um, evaluate each place that we went in Costa Rica uh, for whether it actually met the authentic uh, ecotourism standards. Right? So teaching them about sort of how ecology functions and then um, a lot of sort of the um, aspects that go along with the local community um, and then having them experience this and see whether those that were being touted and advertised as being um, these green ecotourist destinations, if they really were. Um, and so there's been lots of um, issues and problems uh, with some of these places. And it was interesting to see some of the places that got sort of higher ranks from the Costa Rican government um, for ecotourism um, and sort of what they were really doing as compared to some that were lower. Um, so I think that was a really um, good experience for them. You can see sort of the, the definition for ecotourism is not just to go somewhere that sort of, you know, you get to go outside and go hiking. There's really um, a, uh, a conservation to the environment piece, um, well, sustaining the local well-being, um, and involving education, both of the local people and of the people coming to experience um, ecotourism. I had uh, students work on a final project um, for this course where um, we had them develop a business plan to create um, an ecotourism project that would be suitable for the area of Monteverde where we were staying. Um, and that was really interesting um, to see students sort of take their understanding of how to put together a business plan um, and sort of pool the ideas um, that we talked about and experienced um, for the ecology of the area um, and through the local communities and education. Um, so they had to include all these different pieces, um, and we had different groups come up and present uh, their business plans. Um, and um, in the location that we were staying, um, we invited the local community to come and hear um, their business plans. So they were really interested in hearing some of the things that, um, that our students were able to, to kind of come up with. Um, we had one set of students, I'll just pull up two here, um, that created um, the idea of this Ketzel Sky Museum. Um, so the Ketzel here is the, um, you know, the, the, the famous bird in Costa Rica, beautiful bird. Um, and um, they wanted to create, and they sort of worked out all the financial issues and logistical issues, thinking about building it and where it would go and how it would involve um, the local community for this suspended outdoor museum um, that would be sort of up in the trees um, where you could sort of experience the Quetzal and learn about um, this flagship um, species, which was, um, which was interesting. We also had another um, group that um, chose the squirrel monkeys and decided that they wanted to create a fair trade palm oil plantation um, that was 
um, sort of not the typical monoculture idea of the plantation um, and involve um, squirrel monkeys as being able to be sort of housed in this area. So there were, there were some, some interesting ideas, um, I think, that they got from them. Okay, um, so the next um, sort of case uh, study that I wanted to mention um, that I talk about um, quite a bit in my classes are, are life cycle assessments, LCAs. Um, and these are um, becoming better and better known um, you know, since the early 90s um, when a lot of this was sort of first coming about. Um, there's some really complex and interesting uh, computer systems and models that can do these life cycle assessments. Some folks may be familiar with them, things like sustainable mines and things, um, where you can go through and get a full tally and an understanding of the environmental impact of a product at each stage. And so the idea is to try to get at some of that transparency, right, that consumers want. They want to know, you know, is this really, it says sustainable, is it really sustainable? How do I know? Um, and um, so doing this kind of um, analysis looks at um, extraction of raw materials, um, in the manufacturing process, actually distributing those manufactured goods, the use component, so how different products are used, whether they're causing environmental or sort of social harm in that way, and then end of life, so where do they end up? Um, is it a landfill? Is it an incinerator? Does it actually get recycled? Um, and the idea here is to really push companies to think about the whole sort of supply chain so that you're not burden shifting. Um, so companies can't, ideally, greenwash and suddenly come out and say, oh, you know, this product now is, one of my least favorite terms, eco-friendly, right? Um, and that is because we are using, um, you know, uh, sustainable wood. Um, well, if you're using sustainable timber and it's coming from much further away, right, then you just push the burden of environmental harm further down the, the supply chain, right? So um, if you're actually tallying up and trying to figure out, is this, how do you compare these different things, this needs to be kind of a holistic approach. Um, so there's, there's lots of interest in doing this um, in business, and although it's not mandated, there's um, huge consulting um, industries that are popping up that do this um, for different businesses. Um, I have a couple friends um, that are working um, in this area. It's fascinating. So um, I ask my students um, to do this. I don't tell them that there are computer programs uh, that can do this. Um, I tell them that at the end of the project. Um, so it's super mean, I know. Um, but the idea is to get them to actually do the research and figure out, can they find this information? Um, so the group project that I do for my um, ecological management course is have them work together to pick a simple product. And I'll give you a couple examples in just a minute. Um, but pick some simple product it needs to be something that has sort of more than three or four raw materials within it, but not something super complicated, so no iPhones or computers or, or things like that, because um, they just won't have the time to be able to get through all those ingredients. Um, and they need to then fully research um, the environmental and social impact um, of that product at all the various stages. Um, so I have them go through and look at um, physical land space, biodiversity and ecosystem impact, uh, natural resource use, water and air pollution that's produced, solid waste production, and any social impact. Um, so including uh, human health, uh, environmental... <coughs> oh! Mm. Oh, is he okay? <laughs> okay. Um, and um, uh, environmental injustice is something that we, um, that we highlight a lot. I mean, it's just fundamentally a, a climate change issue that comes up um, a lot in my classes that we talk about in labor practices. Who is it that's extracting this material? Who is it that's getting paid? Is it a fair wage to actually manufacture this stuff as it gets moved around? Um, and so I challenge them with having to try to research and find out this information for their product. And as you can probably imagine, the first response I get back um, is, oh, I looked on the website and it doesn't tell me. <laughs> say, well, of course, right? If I created a product right on the front page of the website, I'm not going to say, here's all the environmental harm and social injustice um, that our product causes. Um, so um, students uh, can initially sometimes get um, sort of frustrated by this. This is a challenging, this is a hard thing to do, right? Um, and so I, you know, go through and talk to them about how they need to be able to estimate 
right? This is a really important skill um, that we're, I think, sort of missing a lot when we're easily just Googling for answers um, all of the time. So I challenge them to um, be able to figure out um, something else that would give you some justification, right? So if you cannot find the direct amount, and I want quantities here, right? So if you cannot find out the direct amount of water pollution that's produced per unit of whatever your item is, you need to then go and research and figure out something similar, um, provide a citation for your justification. Um, if you don't know where the cotton comes from, you can find out that most cotton used for t-shirts comes from you know, Georgia, and you can cite that um, and, uh, and then use that in your calculation. Um, so once students sort of get used to that, um, then I think they can kind of get a grounding on this kind of complex, ambiguous problem. And so I have them turn in um, a written report for that um, sort of halfway through the semester. Um, for my current classes, I think it's due next week. Um, so they turn in this big, typically, you know, 20 page or so um, analysis, um, looking through all those different stages um, of environmental impact um, and social impact. And then for the other part of the, um, the project, um, I asked them, because I always like to end on a hopeful note, which you'll see in a few minutes, um, is um, I asked them to think about, um, okay, so here's all the problems, right, with this product. You're a business student, many of you are entrepreneurs, What's the solution, right? Pick one uh, change that you could make across this um, line here of production that would actually make it more sustainable. Um, so just one small change, um, and then pitch it to the rest of the class, assuming that the rest of the class is sort of um, the uh, board for the company um, that you're working for, to convince them that it's a worthwhile investment. Um, so they have to figure out the cost of whatever this change would be, um, and um, then really um, hit home the clear social and environmental benefits of it. So um, I have a lot of students that have a lot of fun um, in doing this, that do some really interesting products. This is um, just a few of them that I've reported out on, um, looking at folks that choose sort of beauty products, you know, even choosing something that they think like Burt Bee, Burt's Bees, which is a relatively sustainable company. Um, you know, there's still environmental harm, right? Absolutely. Everything that we're, that we're creating um, has some sort of um, cost associated with it. And so I'm going through and really recognizing that and analyzing that I think is really valuable. Um, and we have, have students work on food products that are particularly interested in food. So um, things like Chobani yogurt, candy bars. Um, you know, those wrappers are killer, right? They're not recyclable. They're actually different types of plastic and paper melded together. Um, you know, toys, and, and uh, a lot of people are interested now in the, the micro bead face scrubs, right, that are getting into um, ocean waters and causing problems. And I have them come up with kind of their, their major impact and then what they want to propose for their sustainable solution. Um, and this semester, for the first time, I'm actually getting students into the lab to try to prototype their um, solutions. So um, we have, um, we can make some bioplastic, like I mentioned. We're using some natural dyes, so some plant-based dyes, to try to try out, you know, if you're going to pitch that you could, instead of using some of these harmful um, dyes that end up causing massive water pollution problems, you could try to use like a hibiscus um, dye. Um, some mushroom packaging, um, which has been um, getting a lot of attention um, instead of uh, plastics and things. Um, and I actually uh, have had a growing number of students that have wanted to analyze their own products, um, which is fantastic. I think that's great. Uh, I have one student this semester right now that is working on, um, uh, she, her business is creating these covers um, for people to wear, sort of fashionable looking covers for people who have IV lines um, or pick lines. Um, she's actually someone who's had a huge number of health issues, and so she's really motivated to have this kind of fashionable um, uh, accessory, um, and so she's been producing these and selling these, and she was fascinated to try to figure out, okay, what's actually in it, <laughs> right? Where does it come from? What am I, um, what am I responsible for here for an environmental impact? Um, so that's been, that's been really great to see. All right, another um, concept that I think, like I mentioned, really brings um, ecology and business together um, in, a, in a very sort of practical, interesting way is biomimicry. How many folks know biomimicry? Have heard of biomimicry? Okay, so a growing number, I think. It's becoming um, a lot more, um, a lot more uh, well known. Um, so biomimicry uh, is the idea of sort of learning from nature. 
right? So using nature as a model, using nature as something we can measure against, using nature as a mentor. Um, and um, uh, Janine Benyez um, has been sort of the, the mother of biomimicry. Um, and if anyone's not familiar, I encourage you to watch her TED Talk. Um, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and um, the idea is to use these 3.8 billion years of evolution that have taken place as testing grounds, right? Nature's figured a lot of this stuff out. The things that did not work died, right? They died off. Um, so we can look at nature um, as sort of creating these fairly efficient processes and shapes um, and ways of solving problems. So here I'm just showing you sort of the, the basic principles for biomimicry as outlined um, by uh, Janine Benyez and the, the Biomimicry 3.8 group. And uh, we can use biomimicry in, in a couple of of interesting ways, sort of the most common way that it's done, and I'll show you a couple of examples in a minute, is sort of imitating product design from nature, right? So the classic example is, is Velcro, right? The really, really um, sort of uh, old school example where a, chef, a um, sheep herder was out um, and would get burrs all over his socks and things and, um, and his sheep and realized um, that that hook method that was coming from the, the burrs uh, was a fantastic way to create Velcro. Right? So, um, copying sort of how um, nature does things. Um, there's also growing interest in trying to copy ecological processes. So things like photosynthesis. I mean, photosynthesis is really incredible, right? The process splits water. Um, right now, if we're thinking about trying to make um, hydrogen fuel cells and get a pure stream of hydrogen, can we learn from that, copy um, something um, along the lines of uh, photosynthesis? And then I'll talk about, um, in a few minutes, um, sort of biomimicking um, ecosystem uh, levels. So um, I like this um, idea, and I'm directly stealing it with credit from my friend um, Ashin Fanze, uh, who, um, who is an a, a adjunct um, in entrepreneurship um, at Babson. And um, you can look at biomimicry in a couple different ways. Um, so you can think about it as having a design challenge. So if you have a problem, something you need to fix, you can then go to nature, see how nature does it, and possibly solve the problem. So this is one way of doing biomimicry. A great example would be um, fast-moving trains. So uh, these uh, really, really fast-moving trains go through tunnels. When they do that, they're pushing um, air uh, molecules right, um, into sort of um, these, these tunnels. It creates huge sonic booms, right? really, really loud sounds, really disturbing. Um, and so you don't want to have that um, in an area where people are living. And um, so therefore, can we think about how nature has organisms move from one density to another without creating these big um, sort of sonic boom sounds? And uh, researchers went out and they found the kingfisher, which is sort of um, a beautiful example of diving from air directly into water with not even a drop. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing there, right? Um, and so this is exactly what they used. Um, for creating uh, the Shinkansen, so the, the Japanese bullet train. Um, and they've copied sort of the bill feature here of the uh, Kingfisher, and uh, it's been incredibly successful, right? So they're able to go up to speeds of 186 miles per hour, and it's almost silent um, as it travels. The air pressure um, was reduced by 30%, electricity demand reduced, speed increased, um, so sort of all around a, a really great um, advantage. The other way that we can do biomimicry is sort of the reverse, and this is less common. So this is called a, a technology push. The previous one I forgot to mention was a, was a market pull. This is, this is as businessy as I get, right? Um, a technology push. Um, and so this is finding something cool out there in nature and then trying to figure out how you can then utilize it. Um, and a great example for this um, is lotus leaves. So um, if anyone's seen lotus growing, um, they grow in these really murky, muddy waters, but yet they are clean. Um, and they need to be clean because they need to be able to access sunlight um, for photosynthesis. So um, they have this really interesting um, structure, sort of at a nanoscale, um, of tiny, tiny little bumps all over them that allows the mud to sort of roll away with the water. So they're basically sort of self-cleaning. Um, and so we found this out there in nature. And then thinking about sort of, okay, how can we utilize this? This is a really neat 
thing out there. Um, and we uh, created Lotuson, um, which is a paint, an exterior paint um, that you can put on your house so that when it rains, it washes away any of the mud or anything that was on your house. It's mildew resistant um, and um, has been really, really popular. So that's sort of at the product level, looking at biomimicry. But we can also um, sort of scale up and look at entire ecosystems and figure out, OK, how do entire ecosystems function? And can we adapt that into thinking about how ecosystems or sorry, thinking about how businesses um, function. And um, there's been lots of interest in that. This is an old article that um, sort of pushed a lot of this um, about 12 years ago. Um, if anyone's interested, I strongly recommend it. It's a Harvard Business Review article, Strategy of Ecology, um, talking about this kind of um, ecosystem approach to business. Uh, and I always find it really funny um, that uh, the term ecosystem has sort of been co-opted from me <laughs> at Babson. I hear the entrepreneurship folks talking about their ecosystems. Um, and I actually had a, a faculty member uh, <laughs> try to explain what an ecosystem was to me. And I sort of almost fell on the floor. Um, but um, they sort of really taken this approach of understanding how ecosystems work um, for business. Um, and um, there's lots of different interesting ways to think about this. This is just from this article, you know, sort of measuring the health of business ecosystems similar to how we measure the health um, of ecosystems. So um, this is sort of return on invested capital for different types of industries um, over time um, and doing this sort of as a measurement of product productivity, right? So we can think of like NPP um, or also looking at sort of robustness with numbers of firms like biodiversity. Um, and so we have sort of similar correlates. Um, that, uh, that they're, they're using to try to get a handle of sort of this complex way that businesses interact. And I think one of the most interesting things um, to take from this idea of the ecosystem level for biomimicry is a way to try to reduce our waste, right? So if we think about um, sort of the way that our waste production system works, right? We extract things from nature, energy, materials. We use it in our human economy. We make stuff. And then we dump waste back out into nature, right? We have this linear approach that's going in one direction um, and is not an ecosystem approach at all, right? That's not the way that things work. Um, and so there's, you know, sort of a, a correlate here that you can think about with, um, with business, thinking about companies that are autotrophs companies that sort of function like producers, things like metal mining, energy extraction, timber companies, they're getting the raw materials, right, similar to the way sort of plants do things. Then we have huge numbers of heterotrophs, right, um, our um, organisms or companies here that manufacture products. They take these raw materials and they make stuff with them. What we're really lacking are the saprotrophs, right? We have very, very few decomposer companies. Um, out there, a couple of recycling um, companies, but really this is where there's a bulk of interest to try to make these connections, right? To try to um, sort of uh, get this so that we don't have this linear stream anymore. And this idea is called sort of closing the loop um, or cradle to cradle is the other term that's been um, more and more popular. Um, and there's some great books, if anyone's interested. Um, William McDonough has um, done a number of these, Cradle to Cradle and Upcycle. Um, uh, Gregory Unruh has written Earth. Um, we're really trying to look at that supply chain, right, um, that's linear, waste off at each level to close it up, right? Make it so that um, you actually have to cycle things through, similar to the way nature functions. Um, and um, this kind of idea is, part of industrial ecology um, and trying to sort of get to this idea of ideally sort of industrial symbiosis, trying to get companies, okay, I produce this waste product, but that could be a starting raw material for somebody else. We just need to figure out a way to get it there, right, so that it can be useful. Um, and I, have a, I had a student work with me last year, an, an honor student um, who was really, really motivated um, to do this stuff. Um, and we actually, we sent him to um, an immersion workshop put on by Biomimicry 3.8 out in Montana for a week, um, which I think was eye-opening um, for him. Um, and he made some great connections. Um, and he worked with me on this um, idea of really fully analyzing whether industrial symbiosis is possible um, and whether it makes a difference. So looking at the finances behind it, you know, is there actual 
cost savings from being able to connect some of these? Um, and if there are, is it really making an ecological difference? Um, and so it was really interesting um, to work with him on this. He looked through 10 current industrial symbiotic systems that we have out there that are already functioning um, and um, looking for common trends and challenges. And then he focused in on one um, to really sort of analyze um, what was going on. An interesting um, sort of take home piece was that it can be financially, uh, hugely financially beneficial if carbon has a price to it. Without carbon having a price, it's very, very hard to justify the finances behind linking um, all of these things. Um, so to draw together with a couple of conclusions, I think that there's hope. Uh, that's sort of my big take home um, message and I try, like I said, I'm, I'm very optimistic in my classes, although certainly there are some days where it's a doomsday. Uh, where we're talking about the students are leaving, you know, distraught. Uh, but sort of the, the take-home message, I think, for the entire course, and, and certainly um, sort of in general, I think, is that, um, is that there's a lot of hope out there. Businesses are, we're certainly behind, uh, but businesses are realizing they're trying um, to um, sort of take a lot of this really seriously, figure out ways, possibly benefit um, from taking a sustainable approach. Um, there's some really interesting examples um, that I'll just throw up here. Um, I won't go through them all, but sort of the Natural Step um, series that is a group here in Boston that actually has a, a conference coming up looking at um, sort of building sustainable global economies. Um, proposals out there for completely shifting the way business um, is approached, right? New ideas for approaching business. Um, one of the ones that I think um, my students often find um, fascinating is the world wildlife uh, market transformations. Uh, so they've done a lot of work here trying to figure out um, how to work on um, those commodities that impact biodiversity, water and climate um, the most. And instead of focusing on trying to shift um, the primary producers, the extractors, those autotrophic um, uh, companies, um, and instead of trying to change the minds of 7 billion consumers, which is certainly, we need to work in that direction, but that's an overwhelming sort of task, they focus on the supply chain, right? And so they've um, done lots of work with new certifications um, for um, these different top priority commodities um, that they focus in on. We also have the UN working uh, with the brand new Sustainable Development Goals that just came out uh, last month. Um, sort of replacing the Millennium Development Goals um, and, um, you know, pushes for the UN Global Compact. There's over 8,000 companies involved in this from 162 countries uh, pushing um, for corporate sustainability initiatives. So we've got increasing interest in renewables, dedication to renewables, a better push in this system, right, from um, uh, what is the norm Right, trying to make uh, the norm the more uh, sustainable option. Um, better reporting out there. There's desire from consumers um, to report things. There's pushes um, to actually get um, companies um, that are cutting their uh, carbon footprint um, uh, recognized. And so that sort of resource funnel that I showed you in the beginning, you know, I think there's, there's real hope. I mean, part of the concern is what will happen in between here as we try to adjust and adapt as quickly as we can. Um, but I think that absolutely with sort of innovation and creativity, um, we can move to open that um, resource crunch back out. Um, and um, with that, I will just sort of thank uh, my science group at Babson, some of the um, funding through Babson um, that I've had, uh, and all my students and all of you. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi, thanks for the, the presentation. It's really interesting subject material, particularly for me. I'm coming from a wildlife conservation <clears throat> and ecology perspective, and so I'm tremendously interested in sort of the applied approaches. Um, and so for, I'm coming at this sort of from the perspective, okay, well, sort of looking at it from like the perspective of a missionary. How can I talk to people in business to try to improve their practices in some way? And the big thing that I'm always hearing from people in business is, all right, well, I'll change my behavior. It'll make me more money. And so I was interested to hear that some of the approach here at Babson was also to start by talking about risks and not just talking about, oh, can I make you more money? So one thing that I'm curious about is, do you think it's 
a more powerful motivator to say, hey, these are the ways that this is going to come and bite you? Or is it better to say, hey, these are the ways that you can use natural systems and, and more sustainable behaviors to profit more? That's a really, really good question. Um, I think you have to have both. Right? I think that you have to have the possibility for sort of longer term future there's opportunity out there. But I think everyone's motivated by risk. Right? Everyone's worried you don't want to be the one left behind, the one not doing um, what has now become the norm um, and get caught behind. And um, I think in particular, at least, I mean, the only businesses that the <laughs> business folks that I deal with are my students, right? Um, and what I get from them is that they're very, very motivated by not wanting um, to be um, sort of stuck um, out there. Um, so I think you sort of have to have both. Um, and it probably depends upon which person within the business that you're talking to that would be motivated more or less by the other. But yeah, interesting question. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Thanks. Which, um, if students are interested in following up on this in graduate school, because tough students probably aren't going to be able to go to Babson but for, for undergrad, if they're interested in following up on this for graduate school, where would they go? And would you recommend industrial ecology programs? I would just add that as part of the question. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so, I mean, my, <laughs> perfectly honest, right, my area of expertise is field ecology. Um, so I can tell you sort of some good places to go for grad school for that. Um, certainly here is one. But um, for um, following up, I know that there are some really interesting programs growing out um, of the West, so in Oregon, um, I know that they have a number of sort of green MBAs popping up, um, which is, um, you know, I'm constantly trying to sort of push at Babs, and I don't know why we don't have one. Um, but um, I think that, um, you know, Harvard has a great program that, that they've been building, um, and through the Extension School as well, um, for um, some really notable folks um, talking about some of this. Um, and I don't know particular programs um, in industrial ecology, um, but um, I know that they're growing. There's the Journal of Industrial Ecology um, getting more and more popular. Um, so sorry, I'm not sure I can answer your question <laughs> fully, but um, but uh, but yeah, it, it's a growing interest and in sustainability is sort of hopefully coming in more and more into sort of the regular norm, right? That's the idea, so that you don't have to go take these specialized programs. Um, ideally. Thank you, Vicky, for an incredible talk. And actually, I think it's a perspective we don't hear a lot from in the lunch and learn, so thank you for that. And, <laughs> and I have a question, because clearly you have a lot of uh, optimistic students and very enthusiastic, but how many of them actually go out in the real world and take what they learn about green businesses and apply to their own real life businesses? Do you know anything about that? Mm -hmm. Or do they just live and, and get lost? <laughs> we have a growing number. So like I said, I've been at Babson. 2007 um, and sort of, um, you know, the last few years with creating the environmental sustainability concentration, now really starting to track and, and, and um, bring back our alumni, right? Um, and so um, we have an event that's coming up next month where we're bringing students in that are working in sustainable businesses that graduated from Babson as alumni to talk to our students that may be interested to show them, look, here's the value um, of it. So. Um, it's not an overwhelming number um, of folks at the undergraduate level um, that, are, um, that are starting sort of their own businesses within the sustainability field. I find a lot of my students get really excited about this in like their junior, senior year when they put off to finally take science, right? Um, and then realize, wow, this is really cool. Um, and so um, I have huge numbers of students that go into um, Companies that themselves are not known for being really green, and I think that there's huge opportunity there to make change. Um, and so I try to sort of, you don't have to go in and work at the green company um, to try to make a lot of difference. My honor student um, uh, who was working with me last year has a job working with Keurig um, and is actually part of their sustainability company because, as you know, they're bashed for, rightfully so, those little pods, right? And so um, there's huge initiative and interest in trying to change, um, sort of what it, make those recyclable, make them out of, out of other interests. So, um, so there's sort of spotty people here and there. Our graduate students, actually, there's a growing group of MBA students um, that's part of the um, Energy and Environment, which 
son actually works with him quite a bit, um, who, uh, who put on a big conference um, and bring some pretty big, well-known folks. Um, and a lot of those um, people um, are, uh, we, bring, we bring back and are, are doing some really interesting things. So the number is sort of increasing, for sure. Vicki, I have a question about closing the loop. Yeah. Because I, I find this really fascinating. So when I think about an ecosystem, it's sort of like very much they're sort of contained to an area, right? So the autotrophs are working here, the plants are fixing the carbon, the animals are there and consuming it, and the detritivores are there. So that, that whole system is sort of, you can think of it as being in the Middlesex Fells or on the Tufts campus. But so much of our businesses are drawing on global resources, right, mm -hmm. that are pulling things from all over the place. So to closing the loop when it's a global resource base, so you're, I, I just, I'm trying to sort of imagine if there's sort of an example of sort of a community of companies that are co-locating in an area that you might point us to as sort of an example of, you know, collaborative in companies that are closing the loop yeah. in an yeah. area. It's a really, really good point. So it's so much harder to do this if you're not right next to each other. So when my student was working, um, looking at all those 10 different uh, industrial symbiotic systems that are out there, um, the majority of all of them were next to each other to make this work. Um, and there's a great system, I'm blanking on the, the Danish name, but it's in Denmark um, that was one of the first and best known systems for this. And that's absolutely, they um, got sort of benefits to physically move close to each other to be able to then move, okay, my waste product of methane here can then be your fuel source um, to pipe it over there. Um, and so, um, yes, having thinking, one of, the, one of the things that biomimicry often gets criticized for is um, you need to think about the, the species, they're adapted to a specific area, right? And so if you're just sort of idly picking sort of the shape of something that you want to biomimic, you're not thinking about sort of where it evolved to and that environment that it's in um, from a business perspective, you're going to miss, miss a big piece of that, um, right, in actually designing it properly. Um, so yeah, um, looking at the actual system itself and trying to physically move or um, sort of transfer these waste products around gets more and more complicated the bigger out you go. Well, we should probably stop there. Let's thank Vicki one more time, and I'm sure she could stay and answer any questions.